Good morning, everyone. Cool. Let's talk about eye clickers real fast. Uh, two people this morning, which was awesome, came down. They showed me their eye clicker, and I was able to enter the number in manually into the database. So I know that two people are registered. If you have an eye clicker and stuff like that, and you tried to go to eyeclicker.com and it was lame or something, um, either before class or come to my office after class, and we can register it real fast. It's not a big deal. If you have been participating in previous lectures, they will all show up. So don't worry about it. Uh, so basically what that means is make sure you have it registered by the end of the term. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Okay. So once I register it, you'll just see who it is. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So Colton uh, was a good example of what Colton had been doing it, and then he just registered it, and there's like three times or something he's done it. So it's pretty chill. Um, just make sure you do it, like I said, by the end of the term. And stuff. Okay. So it's not a big deal. Very cool. Uh, other important news is that our gas leak was fixed. Woohoo! Uh, some kind of bad valve, I guess, under it. They're supposedly replaced it anyway. So. So good, all right, don't have to do that. Uh, also, uh, today we'll talk about chapter two, part one a little bit more, and then on Friday for our lab, remember to bring the eight balls lab if you didn't turn it on already. Uh, bring problem set number one, you won't turn it in right away, but we'll talk about it so you can self-correct it, ask questions, stuff like that. Quiz number one will follow. Quizzes are just stuff over the problem set. And then finally, we can bring a printed copy of the density in class lab. That way you can fill it out and stuff like that. It'll be due the following Friday. Pretty chill. They should announce the Nobel Prize winners in chemistry today. They've already done uh, physics yesterday, uh, something with quantum mechanics that sounded pretty cool, and also uh, medicine, I believe it was, on Monday. So usually chemistry is after physics. <laughs> anyway, if you hear about it, cool. I'm so excited. Anyway, any questions, any of that kind of jazz? Good to have you all here. So we left off on Monday talking about John Dalton. Now, before chemistry officially started, which was somewhere in John Dalton's range right there of his age, um, before chemistry started, there was a lot of experimentation with chemicals. <laughs> and not just the psychedelic kind necessarily, but also just in terms of practicality. So they discovered sulfuric acid and jazz like that. But around this time, what I consider to be true chemistry is they started thinking about the rules that dictate why atoms are different, why compounds are different, stuff like that. So this was kind of a big thing. And again, it happens, you know, 1700s to early 1800s is where things started to really pick up. So chemistry was born from alchemy and all these other sciences and stuff like that, totally. But this was just a lot more formal of a way to talk about it. So John Dalton really got some rules together that made him what people sometimes call the Newton of chemistry. So Isaac Newton helped physics uh, by developing gravity, cal calculus, and a whole bunch of other things, prism of light, you know? Uh, Newton was the first one, excuse me, Dalton was the first one that kind of pulled a lot of these ideas together for chemistry. His atomic theory was the first one that had ever been created. And of course, it's been edited a lot of times since 1804, <laughs> but it still is something that has a lot of things. Um, this one's important. Atoms of one element are different from other elements' atoms, all right? And on uh, Monday, I showed you little pictures how as the atoms change, they get bigger. So as the atomic number, which we'll talk about, gets bigger, the atoms get bigger. That's exactly it. He also proposed a relative scale of masses. Now, to measure something that small is really difficult. Even today, it's really difficult. But he was the one that thought, well, maybe we could have some kind of relative scale. So we'll base it all. At the time, I think he wanted to do it on hydrogen. Um, what we're going to do, what we do now in traditional chemistry, is we base it on carbon. But anyway. If you hear about the atomic mass unit, and we'll talk about this unit a little bit, it's just a very, very, very small amount of grams. And the atomic mass unit is how they measure the masses of protons and the masses of neutrons, stuff like that. A Dalton, which is the symbol capital D little a, is another term that's used for AMU. And AMU and a Dalton are the same. So this is like an homage to the greatness of him, stuff like that. Uh, Dalton also proposed that chemical change does involve bond breaking. You rearrange the atoms to make the new products, and that's totally right. 
And again, Dalton's laws have changed totally over time, but he was kind of the first one to come together with this stuff, which was neat. So what I'm gonna do now is show just a series of videos. And these are some of the kind of the forefathers and, and people, and people uh, that helped develop chemistry. And it's not super critical that we understand every detail of these videos I'm gonna show. We'll talk about a lot of this stuff coming up. But I do wanna give you a sense of some of the big players that helped develop chemistry as it is today. An electroscope is a device used to detect electric charges. If we induce a charge in a rod, and then touch it to the electroscope. The leaves in the electroscope become charged and separate. The experiment demonstrates that light charges repel one of them. So Ben Franklin, one of the founding people of the United States, was actually really helpful in developing electricity. And we're gonna see that electricity is a big part of chemistry. Ben Franklin and later a guy named Michael Faraday were the ones that really developed a lot of the theories. Um, in Franklin's discovery of electricity and development of what it is, he saw that there were two types of charges which were labeled positive and negative. And we'll talk about these. And sometimes I'll have my hands like at a T like this, and one of them is the positive and one of them is the negative or vice versa. But Ben Franklin was the one to come up with that idea. Another thing that's interesting is that if you have positive and negative charges, they actually attract each other, all right? If you have two negatives or two positive charges, they repel. And that's uh, going to be super important for what we talk about here later on. Also, the total charge of any system doesn't change. So it says it's conserved. And all that says is all the positives and negatives running around at the beginning are equal to the positives and negatives at the end. And there's actually some pretty powerful uh, power, uh, replications of that statement as we'll see coming up. Another thing that's super important is that he saw that the force between the positives and negatives is inversely proportional to the distance. So as an example of what this means, Claire, haven't seen you in a long time. I come over and I shake your hand, stuff like that. Well, maybe I get farther away because I'm being pulled by some student over here. Claire, oh, I can hardly hold on to you. Claire, Claire, oh, and then finally get to some distance and I no longer am interacting with Claire. Stupid example. However, you can see how as I am close to Claire, I can say, hey, what's going on, Claire? How you been? But as I get farther away, I get more distracted, all right, which is like the force of these positives, negatives going down. So eventually there's going to be some distance where those two charges won't interact at all. So inversely proportional means that as you get closer together, as the distance goes down, the force goes up. On the other hand, as the force or distance between them gets larger, then the force between them decreases. So one goes up, the other one goes down. Any questions? Now, besides electricity, radioactivity actually really helped to discover and develop what chemistry is all about. And radioactivity is a very new phenomena, relatively speaking, in terms of science. And in 1896, this guy named Becquerel discovered radioactive uh, behavior of some uranium ores he was looking at. Apparently, he had some uranium ore that he had left next to a photographic plate. And back in those days, you know, they didn't have cameras and selfies, all right, but they had these elaborate kind of big uh, photographic plates that were very sensitive to light. And he had the plates totally encased in fabric so the light would get in. But when he looked at the plates later uh, that had been sitting next to his ores, they had been developed. They were ruined. And he was like, oh, well, they probably made a bad rate, a bad plate for me or something. But he did this a couple times accidentally, and he, they kept being discovered. So anyway, long story short, uranium was kicking out some kind of a ray, like a beam. And it was going through whatever the ore was in, as well as whatever the, the photographic plates were being developed. And so these rays are super powerful. And they would develop these photographic plates, which by the way, are basically silver plates. Um, last week in lab, I put the eight bottles, uh, that one chemical on my finger, and I said, if you don't rinse it off, it'll turn your finger brown. Uh, same reaction, all right? But this is for a photographic plate instead of my finger. <laughs> silver is pretty interesting. 
Now, Becquerel discovered radioactivity, and he did some really cool things. But the real person who is the powerful force behind the discovery and development of radioactivity is Marie Curie. And she is truly one of my heroes of all time. So if Dalton was the Newton of chemistry, and Newton was the powerful person of physics, I would say Marie Curie is the Newton of radioactivity. She's the one that really took this ball and ran with it, all right? And so <clears throat> rays became the term radioactive for substances which emit some kind of unknown beam that they didn't understand at the time. Dalton thought that atoms were indestructible. And honestly, most of the time, that's not a bad assumption to make. But if you get into it, you can make one atom turn into other atoms. It's a very high energy process, and it's difficult to do. Like it would be difficult for us to do right here. Um, in Oregon, Reed College has a small nuclear reactor. Woohoo! Go Portland! Anyway, that's one place where they have the best capacity to turn one kind of atom uh, into another. Uh, recently, I think it was the University of Utah, there was a scare. They thought that somebody was going to do a bomb in their nuclear reactor, and there was lockdowns and stuff like that. Um, so you have to be very careful, all right, not only for political unrest, but also just because this is a very high energy process, all right? You can't just go, uh, you know, behind 7-Eleven and start making these reactions happen. You have to do some pretty heavy stuff. So Dalton thought they were indestructible, but in reality, you can. All right, it's difficult, but you can do it. So what she, and also another guy named Rutherford, we'll talk about in a little bit, found, is there were essentially three types of radiation processes, which she referred to as alpha, beta, and gamma. And these little symbols right here are lowercase Greek letters for alpha, beta, and gamma. This looks kind of like an A, that looks kind of like a B. Gamma doesn't look like a G to me, but that's what the symbol is, okay? And um, alpha, beta, and gamma are actually quite different. And alpha radiation is what they call a helium cation. A cation is a positively charged ion. Now, if you've ever been to a birthday party and you sucked on the helium, I don't like it, just squirm for a while, but after a while, it kind of goes away, all right? Don't do it with alpha radiation, man. It's helium, but it's like super caffeinated. It's not the kind you want to ingest in your body. So this would kill you if you took a helium uh, alpha particle dose right in your mouth. Uh, it would mess with your organs and, and do lots of bad things. So this isn't your, this isn't the typical helium, needless to say. Now, beta is essentially an electron that's also super wired. And you, know, you can use electrons to react with oxygen and do some cool things. You don't want to play with these electrons, man. Beta radiation is also supercharged, and it'll really, really mess with you. But the one that messes with you more than anything is gamma radiation. These two actually have mass, all right? Like, they'll, you can put them on a scale, all right? And if you have enough shielding, as we'll see, sometimes you can block alpha and beta radiation. Sometimes even your clothes would be enough. But gamma is like a light beam, all right? So Clifford, like, turns his flashlight on me, all right? <laughs> flashlight on me, I'm good to go. I'd have to run if I didn't want the flashlight to be illuminating me. That's kind of what gamma radiation is too, man. It's very, very powerful. It's unimpeded by mass. Usually it goes through things a lot better. We passed through charged plates. Radioactive emissions split into three distinct rays. Beta rays are negatively charged. Gamma rays have no charge. Alpha rays have a positive charge. Now, the way they figured this out wasn't so much about the mass, but it was actually about the charge. So helium was a cation, a positive ion, all right? And electrons, which we're gonna see, are negative. So they had some radioactive sources that emitted all these types of radiation. And they put it through what's called a double slit. And all the double slit does is the radiation comes out 360 all around. The double slit just makes it into a nice two-dimensional plane of radiation. So they took then this plane of radiation and they put it through a set of charged plates where one side was positive and one side was negative. Um, then, this is just a big photographic piece of film, all right? And they did it in a dark room, and they let it go for a while. 
And what they found were three places on the photographic plate where something had happened. <clears throat> um, one of them, you can see, went to the left. That's because that thing was attracted to the positive charge. So if opposite charges attract positive negative, this one right here was a negatively charged radioactive thing. And that's what the beta particles were all about, beta radiation. Electrons are negative, negative things attract to the positive, so it kind of curves to the left. On the other hand, there was also one that went to the right a little bit towards the negative plate. So this one was a positively charged uh, radioactive part, that's the alpha ray. But one of them just went straight on through because not only do gamma rays have no mass, they also have no charge. So that's why it's pretty difficult to stop gamma rays. You gotta basically have lots and lots and lots of things in its way. Um, this just shows here the differences in the type of radiation um, because of the mass part. Alpha and beta can usually be stopped relatively easy by some amount of uh, protection. But gamma, you need a lot more. <clears throat> um, alpha is a lot more massive, we're going to see, than beta. Notice how alpha didn't go to the right as much as beta went to the left. That's because alpha is way more, all right? They have more mass, so it's harder to get them to go. But that also means then that usually paper or your clothes will protect you from alpha rays. Beta rays, you need a little bit more. Um, skin is pretty good at protecting us from most beta particles. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit of lead will totally do the trick. But man, when it comes to gamma, it's basically put on the Iron Man suit or run. <laughs> and there's no problem running, in my opinion, because gamma rays are pretty strong. Question. So here's a question stuff that you might run into. And it says here, uh, a glass rod is rubbed with silk, and that gives, as we're going to see, the rod a slight positive charge. So we've got a positive rod. And it says, which type of radiation will be attracted to the glass rod? Now, if this thing is a positive charge, all right, would we expect an attraction to come from a negative, a positive, or a neutral species? Negative, right? Negative, right on. That's right. Opposites attract in relation in relationships. And I'm not saying anything about people in the room relationship, but a lot of times they say that opposites attract. You know, you've got different personalities and stuff that go together. I'll let you philosophize on that later. However, in chemistry, it's absolutely about opposite charges. Yeah. So if we have a positive rod, you're going to need something that's negative. Which one of these up here, if any of them, are negative? Beta. That's right. Beta particles are essentially just electrons. So if you have something positive, those negative beta particles should be attracted to it, absolutely. Alpha is positive radiation. So positive and positive, you'd think that would actually repel that type of radiation. Gamma could care less. <laughs> if it's going that way, it would go there, but it certainly wouldn't be attracted to it. Um, cosmic rays are really interesting. Cosmic rays come from sources like the sun. They're essentially powerful little oxygen atoms or, or carbon or something like that. Um, cosmic rays supposedly made the Fantastic Four in the original comic book version, not the movie version of the Fantastic Four. But anyway, that's, uh, that's something totally different. Anyway, no, ref no references to Fantastic Four will be found on your quizzes or exams. <laughs> Any questions on any of this? Sorry. I mean, no, that's good. Questions? Good. Shut up, then. All right, so Marie Curie, pretty freaking awesome, and stuff like that. <clears throat> All right, Marie Curie had to work outside in a shed and apparently in, in Paris. And apparently in the winter, it was just wicked cold, and in the summer, it was just swelteringly hot. She had to do all these samples. She went through tons of samples for like a gram of radioactive stuff. It was incredible. <laughs> she also, though, was the uh, person that won two Nobel Prizes, and there's not very many people that did that. She's pretty awesome. Um, she discovered two elements, radium and polonium, and radium especially has had a powerful influence uh, on the world in general. Um, she had to buy her own samples. She never had enough money. This group in America, which is still around, actually bought her some samples. In 1919, they raised $150,000, which was pretty cool. 
So she's awesome. Um, the sad thing, she was actually killed by her work. Leukemia is a cancer that comes around from being around radioactive samples, and she was definitely around a lot of samples. So she's pretty neat. Uh, I've read several books by her. She's very inspirational. I love this quote, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Anyway, questions on Now, all of this information led to the development of the atom. And on Monday, I showed a picture like this, how the atom essentially has this rotating, shimmering electron cloud. And again, we'll talk about the electron cloud more in chapter six of Chem 221. But in the very middle of the atom is the nucleus, and the nucleus holds the protons and the neutrons. Now, one thing before I go any farther is on Monday, I did on the chalkboard a little thing where this nucleus is way overblown. It should be the smallest dot in the middle of the atom. It's very, very small relative to the volume of the atom, but that's all right. Um, in a neutral atom, the electrons and protons are equal to each other. So we'll see here in a little bit how to find the number of protons. And if you have a neutral atom, the electrons and the protons are equal. The electrons, like I said, are just kind of shimmering around. And we'll talk more about that in chapter six. But again, just remember, these things are super small. If you put just a tiny bit of water down the sink, you've got more atoms down the sink than there are you know, teaspoons of water in the Atlantic Ocean and all this kind of stuff. So pretty crazy. So what we'll do now is we'll look a little bit more about the different parts of the atoms and what they're made of, stuff like that. Okay, so protons uh, have a positive charge, all right? And all atoms have protons inside them. Now the mass of the proton is very difficult to measure, but they have techniques to do it now, which is fantastic. So the mass of one proton, 1.67, etc., times 10 to the minus 24 grams. Now on Friday, when we do the density lab, I want you to kind of think back to this number because we're gonna measure like 30 grams, maybe 10 grams, nine grams, stuff like that. Whoa, 10 to the minus 24 grams is many orders of magnitude smaller than the types of things that we usually use. Um, this is a very unwieldy map value, all right? Anytime you have a small times 10 to the something, it gets hard to use. So what Dalton proposed and what's been expanded on is this idea of the atomic mass units. And if you call a pro if you refer to a proton's mass in atomic mass units, it's 1.0073 and one AMU is this many grams. So this times this number should give you this number right here. Um, what I wanna point out though, is that the proton's mass is about one AMU, all right? So on a relative scale with these atomic mass units or Daltons, which you can refer to, the proton is about one AMU. Now, electrons, I have a negative charge. So one of the forces that keeps the atoms together is the positive protons and the negative electrons being attracted to each other. And we'll talk about this more in Chem 222. But protons are positive, electrons are negative. Now, the relative mass of the electron, 0.0005486 AMU. So if this proton is about one AMU, and this is 0 0.0005 AMUs, this is really small mass, all right? Um, there's about roughly 2,000 electrons for one proton mass. They're very, very small, all right? So when we start talking about the mass of atoms, we won't, we won't usually include the mass of electrons because they're so small, unless you have lots and lots of lots of sig figs in your calculation you probably don't need to include the electrons. But this positive elect negative retraction is definitely important for the atom stability. Finally, there's the neutrons, all right? Neutrons are neutral. They have no electric charge. Neutrons go next to protons in the nucleus. Now notice the mass of the neutron. 
So this proton was 1.0073. This is 1.0087. So is the neutron heavier in mass or is the proton heavier in mass? Which one of those numbers? Neutron, that's right. The bigger number means more mass, all right? So if we had a scale that could measure these things, the neutron would have the most mass, be the heaviest. Proton would be close to the proton, to the neutron, but it's a little bit less mass. These are both about one AMU, but the neutron is a little bit more massive. And then finally, the electrons, it's about 2,000 electrons per proton or neutron. So electrons would be the smallest. Any questions? So let's put these in order of increasing mass. Ha <laughs> just like I just talked about. And of course, you have all these different possibilities and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> now, increasing mass means smallest first, heaviest last, all right? And of the electron, proton, and neutron, which one had the smallest mass? Electron. Electron, right on. It's legit to look at your notes, man. I don't care. This is just kind of for fun, conversational, all right? So, like, no stress. So, if electron is smallest, and it is, then we can ignore A, B, and C because they start with something else. So, then really, in D and E, where electron is the least massive, which is right, <clears throat> which one is the most massive? Is the most massive neutrons or protons? Neutrons. Neutrons, right on. So the neutrons are the most massive, electrons by far the least massive, and protons are in the middle. Now technically again, protons and neutrons are about the same. Neutrons are a little bit more massive, but they're both about one AMU. Electrons are very, very small, one two thousandth of an AMU. Any questions on that? Yeah, Okay. A cathode ray can be deflected by an electric field. The beam is attracted to the positively charged plate. The beam is also deflected by a magnetic field. For the experiment, we orient the magnet perpendicular to the electrodes. The forces can be used to cancel each other. J.J. Thompson used similar experiments to determine the charge to mass ratio of electrons. So one of the first sciences we're going to talk about in this little section is a guy named J.J. Thompson. And J.J. Thompson was a mover and groover when it comes to developing what exactly is in the atom. And in 1897, again, these dates are just incredible, he was looking at what's called a cathode ray tube, CRT. And CRTs weren't understood at the time, but basically a CRT creates a visible beam. And as it turns out, those visible beams are basically electrons, all right? <clears throat> and electrons, which are negative, go from the negative side, they're trying to get away from it, and they go towards the positive side. Cathode and anode are the fancy terms. We'll use those in Chem 223, but for right now, just realize Electrons, which are negative, are getting away from the negatives and going towards the positive. And what he found is that using a combination of magnets, which is this north-south part, as well as an external electric field, i.e. positives and negatives like we saw earlier, he could start diffracting and moving those CRTs around. And through some science, which was, and by the way, this is an actual picture of the CRT, but anyway, through a combination of these things, he developed what's called the mass to charge ratio of the electron. So he found out, for example, how many coulombs, which is not a number you have to worry about, how many coulombs of charge there are per gram of electron. And that was pretty cool because nobody even knew more than electrons were negative. And he at least had a value that related the mass to the charge. And that's cool. Now, ideally, they wanted both the charge by itself and the mass by itself for the electron. But J.J. Thompson, again, using stuff which seems pretty primitive at this point, uh, was able to figure that out, which was pretty cool. In Millikan's experiment, tiny oil droplets were sprayed into a chamber. By adjusting the charge on a pair of electrodes, Millikan balanced the force of gravity, pulling the droplets downward, with the electric attraction pulling the droplets upward. 
this guy Milliken, uh, in 1913, so almost uh, two decades later, he was able to find the charge on the electron and then the mass of the electron using J.J. Thompson's thing. And again, it's not critical that you understand all the details of this process, but what Milliken did was ingenious. He took little tiny drops of oil and he threw them into this thing right here, and he was able to have a little bit of a charge to it, all right? Now, normally, oil, which has mass, would fall to the bottom. This is gravity. But he put a little bit of a negative charge on the oil drops, and his plates, his, his electrical plates here, these, elect, these negative oil drops would fall, but then they'd be attracted to the positive charge. And by changing the amount of electricity through it, he could see how far and how close they were. And he used a telescope, by the way, to measure these things. It's amazing. But anyway, through all of this, he was able to figure out the charge of electron. And then for using J.J. Thompson value, they were able to actually find the mass of the electron. And that's pretty cool because, again, the electron is super, super small. One two thousandth the mass of a proton. And uh, they found arguably that one first, which is pretty neat. When high voltage is applied to a canal ray tube, electrons are attracted to the positively charged plate, as in any cathode ray tube. The electrons collide with gas molecules, separating electrons from molecules. Positively charged particles are attracted to and pass through the negatively charged plate. When the tube contains hydrogen, these particles are protons. Now, protons were actually discovered after electrons, which is kind of crazy. These little blue dots right here, if we just saw this CRT, this canal ray tube, it would look just like a beam going from this side to that side. All right, that's what those little little blue dots are. But Rutherford, who we're going to talk about more in a little bit, Rutherford actually put hydrogen gas in the CRT tube. Now normally you have a vacuum and stuff like that to see it, but he intentionally put some hydrogen gas in. And a really interesting thing happened. Now this little disc and that disc right there, this is a, a negative disc and this is a positive disc. So these little blue electrons were going towards the positive side because they're negative, they're attracted to this side. But when he put hydrogen in, hydrogen, the electron kind of smashed into the hydrogen. And when the hydrogen was smashed into, it broke apart. And we're gonna see that hydrogen has one proton and one electron. So another blue dot came out and went that way, which are the negative electrons, but the positive proton went towards the negative plate. And nobody had anticipated that. So using this information, Rutherford was able to figure out, aha, these atoms have not just electrons, but they also have protons. Protons are a lot bigger and stuff like that. He did discover that the charge of a proton is in magnitude equal to the charge of electron. They're just opposite signs. So like if the proton is positive one, then the electron would be negative one. And he used a unit called coulombs, which you might use in physics, all right, more probably than here, but the same idea. So we saw that, aha, we got these big protons that are positive, we got the little tiny electrons that are negative, and atoms are made up of these things. Cool. Now, neutrons were even more difficult to discover, and they're the biggest, but they have no charge. So all these positive, negative interactions and stuff, neutrons could care less. So using an even more sophisticated kind of a scale, this guy named James Chadwick was able to discover neutrons. He basically predicted that the scale would have this many protons and this many electrons, but there was extra mass and they couldn't figure out what it is. So that's where neutrons came from. A mass spectrometer is a way that chemists can use to look at the masses of individual atoms. And for about $50,000, you can have your own mass spectrometer gas chromatography from different companies, just what you wanted, I know. So mass spectrometers are a lot easier to get now, of course, than they were at the time. But uh, in 1932, he essentially used one of these to do that. I'll show you mass spectrums later in a super upcoming slide. So atoms have protons, neutrons, electrons, but how are they distributed in the atom? 
So J.J. Thompson thought, well, maybe these uh, little tiny negative electrons are inside some kind of positive medium around it. He figured there was some kind of attraction thing. And once in a while, you'll still see references to what's called the plum pudding model of the atom. And this was an initial idea. And I thought, oh yeah. Now in England, especially where J.J. Thompson was, plum pudding was a common dessert. All right, it's kind of like a, a jello, all right? And inside they'll have little tiny pieces of plum. And that's where J.J. Thompson had the inspiration for this idea. He thought it kind of made sense with the time, but then along came Rutherford, all right? And Rutherford, as well as Marie Curie, these are my two heroes of this section. And Rutherford actually did something that was totally ingenious. In 1910, Rutherford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were scattered as they passed through a thin gold foil. Most of the alpha particles passed through undeflected. However, a few were found to be scattered at large angles some even back in the direction from which they had come. This meant that they had collided with an object much more massive than the alpha particles themselves, yet so small that only a few alpha particles encountered them. This atomic level view shows what is happening. Most of the atom is occupied by the low mass electron. The nucleus is small and massive. When an alpha particle encounters a nucleus, it is scattered at a large angle. These little tiny things going this way are alpha particles, those supercharged helium particles. And Rutherford was sending them into a piece of gold foil, which is one of the thinnest materials of the time that they knew. And then around there, uh, there was a piece of film. Uh, I was hoping for a picture. Sorry, I guess I don't have one, but anyway. Um, in 1910, there, Rutherford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were uh, Fascist technology, <laughs> excuse me. All right, let me go back then to this slide, but this will this will work. Um, anyway, so these little, okay, so in this picture, this will work. These little things right, these are, are alpha particles. And what he found when he looked at the piece of film is that most of the alpha particles just went straight on through gold. It was almost as if there was nothing in the gold itself. It was like a ghost, okay? But once in a while, the alpha particles would come next to the nucleus and they went crazy. They started refracting, they bounced back. Some of them went right back into the initial alpha particle source. It was totally crazy. Now, what Rutherford was able to figure out in this experiment, which by the way is called the gold foil experiment, but he was able to figure out most of the atom is like ghost light. There's not that much there. And so most of the alpha particles, this is like an atom, most of the alpha particles just go right on through. But once in a while, they'll come into contact with that super dense nucleus. And that's when things begin to like bounce to the left or they'll bounce back or they'll go crazy and stuff like that. So Rutherford was the one that figured out, yeah, this nucleus, super, super small. And he wasn't using this kind of stuff we have today to take pictures of the atom. He was actually just using this gold foil experiment. Um, notice these distances here. The atom, approximately the diameter of the atom, about 10 to the minus 10 meters, or an angstrom, as we'll talk about later. But the nucleus, 10 to the minus 15 meters across. So in the Powers of 10 video, which you probably don't remember because it's the first day and I remember my name at that point, but anyway, we went through several Powers of 10 just to get down to the level of the protons and neutrons because they're so small. And that's why uh, the other day when I drew the picture, here's the atom. Well, man, that nucleus is even smaller than that. All right, that's like the best I can do with your instructor. So, so woohoo, Rutherford. Rutherford was born in New Zealand, and he came to England, long story short, and they looked down on him. He was from a, you know, a primitive colony and stuff, but not proper England and stuff. Well, Rutherford rocked the science world, and uh, he was really cool. So he wasn't as intensely opposed as Marie Curie was, but he definitely had some discrimination. Uh, Rutherford eventually went to McGill in Canada to do most of his uh, further research and stuff. He was kind of mad at England, which can't say I blame him, so never say never. Questions? All right. 
So to summarize the atom then, all right, most of the mass of the atom is that super small area. That's gonna have a density which is just crazy small. And we'll talk about that in problem set number two. Electrons kind of circle around the outside. I will talk about that more in chapter six. Um, this is important though. If you're weighing an atom, like on a scale, most of the mass right there in the middle, this area doesn't have very much mass. And that's why I'll use sometimes the term ghost-like because particles can go straight on through. If the atom has a number of protons equal to the number of electrons, it's considered neutral. And in chapter two, part one, that's gonna be very common for us. We'll mostly have neutral atoms. It's hard to visualize how small they are, but in the last decade or so, people have started to take pictures and little home movies, if you will, of little atoms. This is one of the first pictures. Um, this is what they call scanning tunneling microscopy. It's a very uh, hardcore kind of photography. It's not normal, but it is kind of fun. And they were able to take this picture of iron atoms in a circle. Um, an A with a circle on it is an unofficial type of length measurement called an angstrom. And an angstrom is used in chemistry. 10 to the minus 10 is roughly the diameter of an atom. So if you ever get asked on a quiz show, what's the approximate diameter of an atom? One angstrom, 10 to the minus 10 meters. It goes up and down a little bit, definitely, but that's a very rough way to say what it is. So that's kind of cool. Anyway, STM images uh, have been uh, definitely hit up pretty hard by IBM. They've got some really cool kind of uh, things you can see there. But let me show you this kind of cheesy little video thing here, which is kind of cute. individual atoms there, and they're doing it frame by frame to get this, to move the atoms like that is pretty fantastic technology. in my class, but this one is pretty cool. And they actually made a Star Trek little picture. Woohoo! And you don't have to like Star Trek to do well in this class, but uh, it is kind of fun. So again, each one of those, an individual atom they're manipulating, which I find just fantastic. And once in a while in this little thing, there was an atom here or there or something like that. But again, to manipulate those individual atoms like that, pretty freaking cool, in my opinion. So this leads us into what is the periodic table about and how is it organized, all right? And the periodic table, uh, we're gonna use a lot of these ideas we just went through to understand all the pieces. And all periodic tables should at the very least have three pieces of information on them, all right? They'll have a whole number, which we'll call the atomic number, They'll have a symbol, which is a one or two letter kind of representation of the element. And by the way, the first letter always capitalized, the second letter always lowercase. If you are a person that's used to writing in all uppercase, please make an exception for elements. All right, it's a big time thing. And we'll talk about why that's so important. And then finally, the number that we'll use the most in this whole class is what they call the atomic weight or molar mass. And we'll talk about all of these three pieces right here. So the important part here, the first one though, is the atomic number. An atomic number, by the way, gets the symbol Z. 
Z is nothing more than the number of protons in the nucleus, all right? So when you look at the periodic table and you're like, huh, I wonder how many protons boron has, which has capital B for the symbol. Well, look at the periodic table and that whole number, which here is a blue number, which is five, that five says that boron, all boron, has five protons. And you're like, well, that's great, Michael, but how about radon down here in the lower right-hand corner, Rn? No problem. Look at that whole blue number right there. Radon has 86 protons. And this is really important for chemistry, all right? Because if you have an atom with five protons, you have boron. And if you have boron, your atoms always have five protons. And the same for radon, all right? If you have uh, 86 protons, you have radon, and all radon has 86 protons. So the atomic number Z is how chemists distinguish one atom from the other. If you add a proton to boron to make have six protons, you no longer have boron. You're gonna turn your boron into carbon. If you take away a proton from boron, so it only has four protons, it'll then be beryllium, all right? So this is how chemists distinguish one atom from the other. Every time you add or subtract a proton, you're changing its mass, like how much it weighs, and the properties will be quite different from that. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of cool. Mosley was the first one to determine the atomic number in 1914. He used an x-ray technique to figure this out, which is pretty cool. And as you can see now, the periodic table is essentially based on the number of atomic numbers. And again, you can figure this out for any element. So if you have, for example, for your class presentation element, which is due next Friday, as a reminder, if you haven't done so already, calcium has 20 protons because of that 20. And any atom with 20 protons will be calcium, et cetera, et cetera. All carbon atoms have six protons, and if you have an atom with six protons, it will be carbon. Same thing for all the different atoms. So aluminum is number 13 on the periodic table. That tells you that aluminum atoms have 13 protons. And if you say, hey, Russell, what is this element with 13 protons? I'll say, bam, that's aluminum, because on the periodic table, aluminum is 13, et cetera, et cetera. It's important for chemists, all right? So I'm getting a little excited, so uh, that's all right, brother. Questions? Yes. What was the date for the presentation? Um, you have to reserve a class presentation element with me by next week, Friday. So if some of you have done this already, but if you haven't, um, on the website there's a place you can check how uh, which elements are available and which ones are taken, and just send me an email. I can pick one for you if you'd like to. So. What does the presentation do? Um, all these kind of questions, I would refer you to the syllabus, and they have in there the dates. It's the week after Thanksgiving. Yes, that's right. I, the, sometimes it's before Thanksgiving, and sometimes it's after. But in this class, it's after Thanksgiving. Cool. Other questions? All right, one more I clicker question. What would be the atomic number Z of oxygen? Now, knowing the symbols, of course, can be pretty important for these things, but oxygen is just O. So oxygen, you can see, is right up there in the upper right corner, and it's not the blue number that you look for, the 15.9 whatever. You want the whole number, which is number 8. So this thing is 8. All right, that's the number. Now, we're going to talk about the 16 value, about 16 value on oxygen uh, coming up. But for right now, the atomic number, the number of protons, is just eight. So. Any questions on that? Okay. On uh, Friday, we'll talk about the mass number. Um, mass number is essentially equal to protons plus neutrons. And spoiler alert, these red numbers will often be close to the mass number, but they won't usually be the mass number. And that's something we'll talk about more on Friday. Any questions? Have a great day. I'll see you on Friday.